Good evening, everyone. My name is Caroline Bowman. I'm the director of Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And thank you. Thank you. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome all of you here for our Design by Hand Design Talk with Pixar's John Lasseter. This really is the event of the season, and to accommodate demand, we decided to host tonight's design talk in Museo, Museo del Barrio's stunning El Teatro, which seats a few more people than Cooper Hewitt's lecture room. Tickets sold so fast, not even Woody and Buzz Lightyear could get their hands on them. And I think when I was coming in, I saw sadness outside weeping, I don't know. Seriously though, John, is a legend, and it was something else to witness the teenagers today following him as we walked through the Cooper Hewitt. Design by Hand is Cooper Hewitt's series of workshops and conversations dedicated to the exploration of the vital role of the human hand in the, in the design process. Many thanks to our partner Van Cleef and Arpels, and thanks to them, we have brought the designers of iconic firms like Mari Mecco, Heath Ceramics, Ralph Rucci, and now Pixar Animation Studios to the museum to lead hands-on workshops for all ages, as well as to take part in public discussions. Pixar, of course, is the perfect fit for our Design by Hand series. And when you visit our installation, Pixar, the Di Design of Story at Cooper Hewitt, just a few blocks south of here, you see why. Exploring the more than 600 preparatory drawings, paintings, and sculptures Pixar designers have created by hand to make their classic films and that are now installed on our digital tables and in our process lab, you really see that. No matter how technologically advanced we become as designers, the hand remains critical to the creative process. Tonight's conversation coincides with the launch of an exciting three days of immersive learning at Cooper Hewitt with members of Pixar's creative team. In fact, just this morning, over 80 fourth and fifth graders from PS 102 in East Harlem took part in a Pixar-led workshop where they sculpted dinosaurs and designed their own inside-out characters. The students were simply enthralled with the design process and amazed to learn how hard Pixar designers work on each film project. When told how much time it took Pixar to create Inside Out, one student said, four years, that's how long I've been in school. <laughs> I'd like to give a very warm thank you to Pixar's talented Brim Imagiri, Chris Sasaki, and Albert Lozano for sharing their expertise with our Design by Hand workshop participants. And I have to give a shout out to our curatorial director, Cara McCarty, and deputy director of education, Kim Roblita Diga. It was very funny today, after meeting with John at the museum, Kim said to me, working on this Pixar project with the Pixar team and meeting John Lasseter today, I have to give my res resignation. It can't get any better than this, which I just loved. Special thanks as well to our dear friends at Van Cleef and Arpels for their generous support of Design by Hand. Alain Bernard, president and CEO of Van Cleef and Arpels in the Americas, has created a special video message for us tonight, which I'd like to share with you now. Good evening and welcome. I am Alain Bernard, president and CEO of Van Cleef and Arpels in the Americas. On behalf of Van Cleef and Arpels, we are proud to welcome you tonight as we continue our partnership with the Cooper Hewitt to bring you the fourth installment of the Design by Hand series, Pixar, the Design of Story. The development of Design by Hand was born out of the museum and the Maison's shared belief in the importance of the Design by Hand process and the mutual desire to preserve interest and awareness on exceptional craftsmanship across the arts. In many ways, the Pixar's approach to design is much like our own creative process at Van Cleef and Arpels. While the link between hydrury and animation may seem unlikely, and our tools may be quite different, our core objective is the same. We are both in the business of bringing imagination to life. Each of our creations begins with a story. 
one that captivates imaginations and captures our emotions. Each stage of the design process calls upon exceptional talent, true masters of their craft, who rely on innovative techniques and unparalleled expertise to transform these ideas into their own forms of art. In the end, our creations present our own unique and positive vision of the world, where butterflies and ballerinas are transformed into precious jewels, and where our childhood toys, curious robots, and good dinosaurs are transformed into cherished characters. A vision of the world as it should be, not always as it is. We really want to extend our thanks to a few people in the room tonight who have made this evening possible. To Caroline Bowman and the Cooper Hewitt for continuing to be champions of design through educational programs such as Design by Hand. To Michael Beirut for leading this evening's discussion. And of course, to John Lasseter and Pixar Animation for allowing us an inside look at your design process and reminding all of us all that great art begins with a great imagination. Thank you very much and have a great evening. We are really missing our friends at Van Cleef tonight. Um, we, could, we wouldn't be here without them and we really thank the whole team at Van Cleef um, from the bottom of our hearts. Great design does indeed begin with a great imagination, but few possess an imagination that compares to the brilliance of John Lasseter, chief creative officer of Pixar and Walt Disney Animation Studios. It has been a long dream of ours to bring John to Cooper Hewitt to share his singular vision. During my recent unforgettable tour of the Pixar campus, what really struck me were the designer's studios, which reflected the designer's creative spirit like nowhere else I've seen. And John's office stops you in your tracks when you see every inch filled with his marvelous collection of antique and contemporary toys. It has become part of film history that in 1986, when John showed Pixar's new studio owner, Steve Jobs, the storyboards for his first computer-generated short, Tin Toy, Job, Jobs gave but one comment. All I, all I ask of you, John, is to make it great. And boy, did he ever. Both in his storytelling and his use of technology, Lasseter showed the world that computer animation could be just as emotional and exquisite as any classically animated feature. And since winning an Oscar for his first feature, Toy Story, in 1995, John has animated, written, directed, produced, and even acted. Yes, I said acted. How do you think animators make their characters so lifelike in one classic movie after another? When The Good Dinosaur opens la later this month, it will be Pixar's 16th feature film, and as with every Pixar animated feature, the realness of Arlo's world will be breathtaking, and the story of a dinosaur and his boy will move you to tears. John will be in conversation tonight with Michael Beirut, another design genius and a dear friend of mine and of Cooper Hewitt's. A graphic designer, author, design critic, an educator, as well as a partner in the international design consultancy Pentagram, Beirut was the recipient of Cooper Hewitt's Design Mind Award at the National Design Awards in 2008. It is now my enormous pleasure to welcome John and Michael to the stage. There was a big, big debate <clears throat> before you guys came in as to, there was a big, big debate before you, know, you guys all came in as to, should I sit under Woody or Buzz? And Michael <laughs> sit under Woody or Buzz, so. You got Woody? I, I let, yeah, I let you <laughs> choose. He kind of looks like Buzz, doesn't he? <laughs> so, um, John, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. Um, so glad to be here. Um, glad you're here too. If you haven't seen the uh, Pixar Design by Hand at the Cooper Hewitt Museum exhibit, you have got to go see it. It is, I'm really proud of it. The uh, Pixar team 
working with the incredible Cooper Hewitt team has done a great exhibit, and it's very inspiring. You know? Yeah, it's beautiful, and uh, you know, with Cooper Hewitt being the, the, our country's national design museum, it delivers more thinking about what design is and what it can do in more concentrated a space than I think any anywhere in the world probably so it's really an amazing thing well worth your time and you'll be able to spend a lot of time there trust me um, John yes when you were little what did you want to be uh, when I was little um, my mom was an art teacher and so all I really cared about was drawing you know in painting and whatever my mom would bring home at the end of the school year all of the kind of paints and things that would kind of dry out and the you know, old construction paper and board and we would just draw and do stuff and so I, and I always loved cartoons as a kid even when I was growing up when I should have been into girls <laughs> or cars or sports I still loved cartoons I would quietly race home with my best friend and we sit and watch um, Bugs Bunny cartoons at 4.30 every afternoon. <laughs> and I, I just, I just love that. And so when I was a freshman in high school, I read a book called The Art of Animation by Bob Thomas. And it talked about how Walt Disney made animated films. And it dawned on me. And I seriously, I never even considered that the, the people actually make cartoons for a living. You actually could get paid money to draw cartoons for the rest of your life. And I was like, that's what I want <laughs> to do. Sign me up, yeah. That's, sign me up, that's what <laughs> I want to do. And my mom, bless her heart, I mean, I was kind of rare to have, you know, a mother who really felt that the arts was a noble profession. And because she really felt that way. And, and it, it was her whole life of being an art teacher. And, it was, um, and she said, you know, that's a great goal to have. And I said, I want to work for the Walt Disney Studios and be an animator. She goes, that's a great goal to have. And from that point on, that's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Um, do you remember the first um, movie you saw that really kind of moved you, that sort of like transformed you in a theater? Um, the, right after I read that book, The Art of Animation, I um, I remember um, going to see, and this, for all you young people, you, 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 you didn't experience this world. Before there was a home video, yes, there was a before. <laughs> um, there was, there was this, such things as a first run movie theater, then there was the kind of the general movie theaters, the second run, so on, and then there was always your last run movie theater, the budget one, and it was, for me, it was, I grew up in Whittier, California. It was a Wardman Theater, Uptown Whittier, 49 cents to get in. And you knew when it stopped, when it left the Wardman Theater, you were never gonna see the movie ever again in your life. <laughs> and, and I remember uh, uh, a re-release of um, The Sword in the Stone, the Disney animated film, was at the Wardman. And my, I, I begged my mom to take me up there. She dropped me off. I went in by myself. I sat and watched that. And I had seen cartoons my whole life and loved them. But it was now with this new um, realization that this was an art form that people actually created. And I looked up there, and, and, and it was just pure magic to me. And I remember coming out and sitting in, in the car. My mom picked me up, and that's when I said, I want to work for Disney. I want, I want to be an animator. She said, John, Johnny, she always called me Johnny. That's a great goal to have. And I just was filled with it. And so that, to me, always has a special place in my heart. But my favorite movie of all time is Dumbo. I think Dumbo is like... Well, what do you like about it? What, what? It's like a near-perfect film. The more that... I always loved it because it was so funny. And I always thought how amazing to have a main character that actually never speaks a word mm. through the whole movie. I thought that was really interesting. It's the most cartoony of all the Disney films, which I love. And, but it's, and it's also very short. It's just over an hour long. And it's so concise, the storytelling. But the more I um, learned about you know, animation and storytelling and filmmaking, um, the more that I realized how tight the story was yeah. and yeah. stuff. So, 
even the 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 more that I learned, the more I love the movie. And as you talk about uh, uh, that character never saying a word, I, I think immediately of films like uh, Up and Wally that have prolonged almost movie tell a whole movie's worth of story at, in the first few minutes without saying a word. Often. Yeah, it's a really remarkable thing to be able to do. And, and you, you, I mean, you would say that's like in a way the essence of storytelling. Yeah, because um, one of my mentors. And, and whose work really, really always inspired me was Chuck Jones, who was a great um, Warner Brothers cartoon director. And he, um, he always said, John, great animation, you should turn the sound off and still be able to tell what's going on. And that's always been sort of as I've made films myself and then overseen the films at Pixar and, and Disney Animation, um, it's my big mantra to, to all the filmmakers is like, how can we tell the story visually? And it, it's it, it, the dialogue and the voices and all like that is great, but telling the story visually and if you you know all of the short films we've made at Pixar, most of them in, in Disney now as well, most of them are, are told without any dialogue yeah, at Luxo all. Junior, which is on view. Uh, 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 you can go watch Luxo Jr. like any time the museum is open. It's on continuous view right next to uh, the right. movie the exhibit as part of the exhibit. And, and their, um, our new movie, The Good Dinosaur, is probably our most... Uh, I'm so proud of this. It's, it's in a weird way. We've, we've made very brave movies before in the sense of doing something no one else has ever done before. But this is really special, this film. It is... There's a simplicity to it that was really hard to get, get, and um, and there's only dialogue in 20% of the film. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. And one of the main characters, the little boy character in it, actually never says a word the entire time. And it's really, um, but it's I would say it's one of our most emotional films. You know, Pixar's made some emotional movies, <laughs> don't you? Don't you think? Yeah, um, <laughs> this one's gonna gut you. <laughs> bring that, bring the hankies. Yeah, I'm warning you. No, I heard there was gonna be that that little preview before, and I brought my handkerchief and mm -hmm. used it actually myself, so I can vouch for that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a little tangent. I think I read somewhere that one of the directors you admire most is Preston Sturges. Oh yeah. But he's extremely verbal. You know, yeah. all that rapid fire screwball comedy oh, back and that. forth. It's is. I mean, um, what do you admire about that? Well, it, it's it's his strength of character. Mm. The, the incredible, he creates characters that are incredibly smart, yeah. incredibly witty, and very, very, very clever. Um, I would say also, there is a moment, to, I saw a film of his when I was at CalArts, and I had never seen it before, and it had a, such a profound effect on me, and it was Sullivan's Travels. And do you guys know Sullivan's Travels? If you don't, please go see this film. It's a remarkable film. It's very, very funny. Preston Sturgis made really, really funny um, movies and very, very and daring bur movies too for the time. Yeah, this movie though is, is really exceptional. There's um, it's it's about the main character is like a Steven Spielberg like director, like the most famous director in Hollywood for his comedies and his feel-good movies. And it's the depression. And he's feeling so guilty because all these people are out of work and stuff. And he says, I want to make a drama. I want to make a great American drama. And he goes on the road. He, he decides to, to, to uh, do a thing where he becomes a hobo with his friend to see what it's like. Well, they turn it in to a big publicity stunt, and there's a giant bus with all these um, press behind him as he's walking down the street <laughs> with a knapsack on. I said, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> so he needs for him just in the middle of the night ditch, and they just disappear you know, in, in a railroad yard. But immediately he's mugged, and his jacket is stolen from him, and it had his identification in it sewn into the lining. And the, the guy who mugged him get, got killed in a, in a train accident, and so they thought that this great, great, great filmmaker Sullivan had died, and they did this giant Hollywood funeral for him and all like that. Meanwhile, he wakes up, knocked out on 
on a train in, in the south and he's arrested for being a hobo and, and trespassing on a train and he's thrown into a work prison. And, and, and no one believes that who he is because the guy just died. And they have this funeral for him and so they don't believe. So he's stuck. But, but the, the profound moment comes late, later on. He's had a miserable time in this prison and, and, all, and Christmas Eve, he and his fellow prisoners are invited to, in the segregated South, to a black church to sit and, and, and have a Christmas Eve, you know, worship. They, and, and then they, at the afterwards, they pull out a projector and they show a Pluto cartoon, the famous one where he gets his, um, his, his paws stuck on the flypaper. Well, very legendary, great cartoon. It's really funny. And in the depths of their misery, both the parishioners of this church and, and, the, and the prisoners, they're laughing hysterically. And he realized the power of, of movies to deeply entertain people and to, for a moment in their life take them out of, of their daily lives and they get lost in this pure entertainment and he sees the importance of what he does and, and how entertainment is actually a good thing. And, and when I saw this, and it's a source, he, he figures out a clever way, I'm not gonna tell you how, but to get, get back, and then they say, oh my goodness, you've had such a horrible existence, you've clearly got great material to do a drama like you wanted to, and he goes, no. I'm going to make comedies. That's what this world needs. And, and it had such a profound effect on me because I've always been so deeply moved by the films of Walt Disney. It's why I do what I, I want to do, that, that, that very special entertainment that only Walt Disney was able to do. And I just really wanted to do that. But when I saw that movie, it just really like, affected me so deeply, saying that's what I want to do. You know, and it was, it was, I was already at, at animation school at CalArts, but this really had a profound effect. And by the way, you just um, heard John Lasseter pitch a movie to you. So <laughs> many have not had that privilege. Thank you, John. Even though it was made, uh, you know, 60 years ago or so, it was fantastic. Um, um, can you talk about CalArts a little bit? Um, yeah. Um, talk about your, your first day there, your arrival there, what you were expecting and what you found. CalArts, um, I was very, very fortunate. I graduated high school in 1975, and, um, and I know to all you young people, yes, yes, we had pencils and paper. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't we weren't carving on stone back then. It's, I know it's a long time ago to you, but, but we, um, uh, I, I was really fortunate. I had written to the, the Walt Disney Studios and, and, and sent them my drawings and say, I'm really interested in becoming a Disney animator. They were great. They invited me over, they walked me around the studio, they introduced me to animators, and they were so excited to have a young person really interested. And they, they, at that point in time, they recommended, um, you know, this, I think I was probably a sophomore in high school at this point, and they recommended wow. to me to, um, to take a, a great um, grounded, uh, art education, just a general art education, then come to the studio and they would teach, teach us, teach me animation, right? Because there was really no animation schools that taught their style. And so I said, that's what I'm gonna do. And, and then um, I got a letter in my senior year of high school saying that they were starting a Disney style character animation program at California Institute of the Arts, which was a school that uh, Disney helped um, uh, found with, with combining Chouinard Art Institute and the Los Angeles um, Conservatory of Music together in one school. And, and they were going to start it, and, and they invited me to submit a portfolio, and I couldn't believe this, so I submitted a portfolio. I was the second person accepted to the program. And so we, we started that, that class, and they made the first couple years classes out of young people that had been writing to the Disney <laughs> studio. So we were incredibly passionate. And it's like we found our tribe, right? I was like a lone nutcase at my school that I loved, still loved cartoons and wanted to make cartoons. And we were all that same way. We were so excited and passionate. But in my class, I was um, 
John Musker, who went on to do, is, I still work with him, Little Mermaid, you know, Aladdin, just some of the greatest Disney films. Uh, Brad Bird, who you probably know with Incredibles and Ratatouille and, and Iron Giant. <coughs> um, Tim Burton. Um, uh, Chris Buck, who did Frozen. Mike Giamo was the art director on Frozen. And kind of on and on, a guy named Joe Lancicero, who's one of the, the head Imagineers for, for Walt Disney Imagineering. So we are all in those first two years what of What was classes. that like? What, I mean, what were you guys like as college freshmen? I'm trying to like imagine this. We were, we were nerds, and we couldn't get a date to save our lives. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of time. Plenty of time to spend in the studio. Oh, we were, oh it, was, it was rough, I tell you. <laughs> I mean, back in those days, you know, it, it being, being like wanting, wanting to be an, being an animator and wanting to be an animator, it's like there's no way any girl in Los Angeles would ever like Oh, that's nice. Okay, I'm <laughs> walking away from you. And we, and, and no one had girlfriends, and no one could get a date. And we all just kept hanging out with each other, you know, all the time and stuff. But we, we loved. We we actually had so much fun together. We probably learned. Was great is, our teachers were these great, Disney, animators that they had pulled out of retirement, that that had had helped invent the art form of animation with Walt Disney. And they were, most, none of them had ever taught before. And they would come, and so they would kind of teach us lessons about the, the you know, my design teacher was, Ken, um, a layout teacher was Ken O'Connor, who was a great, great, great Disney layout artist and invented so much things, you know, within Disney films. And, and he was Australian and had a dry sense of humor. And he said, I've never taught anything before. I'm just going to tell you what you need to know. And I said, <laughs> good, it's good for me, you know. And they would go, they, they had access to, to the Disney, um, you know, the, the archives in the morgue. And they would bring all this original Disney artwork, um, pin it up on our boards. And it was just pin, 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 pin. And, you know, these things are worked like millions of dollars now and they're just pinning them up on the board and you know and we're like amazed by this stuff and they would talk about it and and it was really great and then in the afternoon we and it was very interesting because our classes were structured very old-fashioned art education we had one class that was the entire day figure drawing design uh, layout animation you know we basically had spent the whole day you know, really, really working and studying. And it was, um, it was magical because mm -hmm. after lunch, you know, they would just start, start telling stories of working with Walt Disney and inventing this stuff and hearing the good and the bad side. And, and it really was fascinating to hear, you know, the difficulties of working with Walt as well as like how magical he is. I mean, you know, there, there is, the, you know, the historians tend to tell, um, you know, the, 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 all the grandfatherly and positive sides of Walt. But he was, he was tough, and he was strong, and he was driven, and all these things. And, and it, was, it was fascinating, um, you know, it was absolutely fascinating, you know, hearing all those stories. And in fact, so much of my leadership, you know, th the things that I've learned is, was from those stories mm. of what to do and what not to do, you know, and, and hearing those stories. And, and I, I can't imagine it was like, now I look back and I realize, oh my God, what they were doing. They were handing the torch off to us mm. because there was a short period of time in the 1960s that they actually, after Walt had died in 1966, they actually were considering just closing the animation department at Disney and not making any more Disney animation. But it was this handful of great Disney animators that said, no, let's start training a new generation. Because what happened is that they, they were doing all, all the work and they didn't hire anybody at the Disney studio for a good 20 years, from like through the 50s and 60s. They never hired anybody. And so there was, and so they, they, they started bringing, started a training program. One of the great Disney animators, uh, Eric Larson, said, I will train the new animators when they come in. Then, then they started the character animation program right behind that as, as a feeder to, to Disney. And 
And it was pretty remarkable. And now that looking back at it, it was, um, I was, I was telling Michael that, that I, I was, um, the, the head of the program was Jack Hanna, who did all the, the, the Don, Donald Duck. He's not Hanna-Barbera Hanna. It's Jack Hanna was, uh, um, directed all the Donald Duck cartoons. And he was the head of the program, and I, I, he asked me to be his student assistant. And I worked at the Disney studio the summer between uh, graduating high school and starting the program in September. And it was only, now looking back, I realize it was only nine years after Walt Disney had died, which at that point in time, it was half of my life practically. It was half of my life. I was 18. And, and it was... Yet, but now it's like a drop in the bucket, just and it was yesterday. amazing, yeah. just yesterday. Yeah. And so it was just so exciting to think back of being there during that time, and all the, the, the great the Disney artists were still working in the, in the, in the prime of their, their lives. And it was so exciting, and we, we just talked about animation. But I learned a lot from them, tremendous amount, but I also learned equal amount from my fellow students. Mm -hmm. We were so passionate about this, and we, there were, it was... Um, Disney had given the CalArts Library um, 16 millimeter prints of six of their animated films, six of them. And we kept checking those films out and, and we would watch them again and again and again. We had a 16 millimeter projector in our animation room. And um, <clears throat> we were kind of the new kids on the block at CalArts. And so they gave us this, this room. All of our classes were in the same room and there was no windows, it was kind of in the basement. The room have a number or a name or anything? Yeah, it was the, the famous A113, if you've heard of that. I put it in all of, all of our films. <laughs> um, Brad Bird puts it in all of his films. We, and I think Tim Burton has put it in some of his films too. Anytime there's a license plate or a room number or something, you'll see A113 used a lot. <laughs> and a part of it is it's because it's a badge of honor because it was the room no one else wanted. And <laughs> it was really, it was like, it, it was, it was, but we, we, we loved it because of that. It was like a bunker. You were down inside. And we were right across the hall from the Indonesian gamelan room. <laughs> Gamelan's a beautiful, beautiful form of music. But hearing, like, American kids um, learn it... <laughs> I had no idea what it was. At first, we were sitting there, like, drawing, doing this stuff, and are we near the kitchen? Or something like that? They're like banging pots and pans all the time. I go, what are they doing? And finally, me and a couple guys went over there and kind of poked our heads in, and it was like, oh, it's music. I didn't know. And so anyway, but I, you know, I finally went to a Gamelon concert and it's magnificent music, but it was hard to hear, hearing people learn it all um, the time. Did you guys feel like you were girding to fight a lonely battle? I mean, the yeah. films you were watching, you know, yeah. none of your friends were watching these old films. Oh they my were, God, they yeah. Were, they were watching Dirty Harry or whatever was big in the mid 70s. And, and you must have thought that there was this, uh, that these guys were passing not only a torch, but sort of like a flame that was barely flickering, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good it's a good way, Michael, it's a great way to put it because you know, we we had this strong belief that animation was for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um Walt Disney when he made his films, he made them for everyone. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs when it came out was the number one movie of, of, of nineteen thirty eight. The number one movie. The first first feature-length animated feature, feature film. Um, it, it, you don't get to be number one with just kids going to it and right. families, right? And so we believed in that. Chuck Jones, all the Warner Brothers cartoons we know and love were made to be seen in theaters before Warner Brothers films for adults. But it was television. When TV came along, um, the movie studios closed all of their anim all their cartoon studios. Every big uh, major Hollywood studio had their own cartoon studio making cartoons, and they cl they closed them down, and they sold their libraries to television. Television showed um, showed cartoons only during kids' hours, Saturday morning and and after school, and 
so it was during kind of the late 50s and mostly the 60s, the public opinion of who animation was for sh mm. shifted, shifted to being, oh, it must just be for kids because television is only putting it on during the kids' hours. And so even when we started um, working at the Disney Studios, even the folks, like the great Disney animators had retired, and it, there was this kind of second tier of, of animators, like during Walt's time, that were not the, the ones that were really good enough to be a top animator. They were, they, they were in charge through attrition, not through talent. Mm -hmm. And they were really scared of us. And they firmly believed what they were making was just for kids. And we were like, you know, and, and I don't know if you know Brad Bird, but he's so passionate about like, come on, man. It's like, <laughs> it's like the, this revolution that was going on in, in, in cinema with, you know, with Francis Coppola, with Scorsese, yeah. with with you know Spielberg and Lucas and Star Wars had come out, man, and like Raging Bull, come on, <laughs> we can do this in animation, you know. And we were, but that's how we felt. We said we 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 want to make movies for everybody. We believe in it, and we literally were the only ones that believed that. We literally we were the only ones. There was the the, the animation industry in, in Hollywood existed. It was Disney. And it was Hanna Barbera and Filmation, and that was about it, you know. And they did Saturday morning cartoons. It was really cheap, limited animation. And Disney would, was was putting out a movie every four or five years, um, and and even they were thinking it was just for kids. But we really believed, and we kept pushing, and we kept pushing, and we kept pushing. And that time at the Disney Studio was was really hard. I mean. It's, it's amazing to have this dream yeah, yeah. For, for so much of your life, to work at the Disney studio, to be there. To, you know, I went to you know, CalArts and I breathed all these stories into myself. It became part of my DNA of working with Walt and all these things and invention and all this stuff. And, we, and I can't tell you how it felt to have your dream so thoroughly crushed when you got to the place of your dreams and they didn't want to hear anything from you. You know, I, we kept trying to make the movies better, kept pushing, kept trying to, to, to do things, and I just kept getting into trouble. Well, what were the kind of arguments you would have? Like, what would, like, what would you propose and why well, would you okay. reject it? Here's a great example. So, I don't know if you've seen The Fox and the Hound, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't applaud, please. I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that was a film that we, we were working on when, when we got there. And, you know, it, it, was, it, had, it started out with these amazing, amazing pastels by this great Disney artist named Mel Shaw. Oh, my gosh. This guy, I, I had the fortunate opportunity to work with him for a while, and he taught me how he drew pastels. And... I just loved his drawings of this, this incredible story of, of like, you know, a fox and a hound becoming best friends when they're young and they grow up to be, they separate and then and they come back together as adults and they're, and they're supposed to be mortal enemies. You know, it's such a great story. And it's like, <laughs> in the hands of these guys, it was just pathetic what they were doing. And we were watching it and we are just going, this could be awesome, but it's not. And so we kept pitching ideas like that. And I was liter literally told by the guy who was managing the animation department, he said, we don't want to hear your ideas, just be in your office and do what you're told. And you know, if you don't want to do that, there's a line of people outside this, this studio that would be willing to take your place. Mm -hmm. I was so hurt, and I thought, that's amazing. In, what's that, three sentences, the guy just made me not care about the project and not care about this studio. And I just thought to myself, boy, if ever I'm in charge, I'm never going to say to a passionate young person who's just trying to make the movie better, I'm never going to say those words to him. 
because what you want to do is encourage the opposite, I thought. I'm never going to do that. And it actually formulated kind of a way that I was dealing with this as I was learning what not to do. You know, and, and we have, my wife Nancy and I have five sons, and their entire life we told them, you will, and all of you young people, you will in your professional situation go up against people who are threatened by you and, and are, you know, and are scared of you or don't want to listen to you or are auteurs and single-minded and folks like that. And just in, in the worst situations of, in your professional life, just learn, take out the positive spin on it and just learn what not to do from it. Because one day, you know, you will, you will be in charge at some point in time and never do what that person did to you, to the, the, the young people in charge. Never do it. Because, because to me, you know, creativity is about collaboration. And you can't possibly have all the ideas in the world. You can't. And animation is the most collaborative art form there is. And, and it's about one person saying one thing and the other one, I hadn't thought of that, that's a great. And then you could do that. And you go, oh, I, that's it. And, and, and it just snowballs with great ideas. And that's the foundation of a great creative collaboration. It's what the great Disney animators all had together. And, and it's just this, this, this excitement building upon each other's ideas. And, and it's like we were just being squished at that time. But I, did I stop? No, <laughs> never, I didn't stop. I just would go to somebody else and pitch ideas and stories. <laughs> and so I got, we, 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 we were talking to, um, we saw a screening of Fox and the Hound and the ending was so pathetic, you know, it was awful. And so I got together, um, my real close friends were the great Disney animator, Glenn Keane, and um, Randy Cartwright, another great Disney animator, the three of us were sitting there and just talking and talking and talking. And I remember this one incredible drawing Mel Shaw had done of this waterfall. And you know, they, they wanted to have a bear come in and, and you know, threaten the, the hunter, the hunter owned the, the hound dog, and, and get in this thing where basically, you know, at, at one point the hunter's about to shoot the fox and, and, um, and the hound dog steps in the, in the way and there's a bear and it just was, was like messy and it had no emotion, no power, no nothing. And so we pitched this idea to have this incredible bear come in I think, yeah, we came up with the idea with a bear come in and, and have this, you know, really have this exciting ending and bring, bring it to this emotional point. And the only thing that could be more powerful than this bear is this giant waterfall. And we said, oh, we could do this. And so we pitched this idea to one of the directors. He said, oh, that sounds great, guys. And then he went off and he storyboarded it. And later we, we heard that the head of the studio goes, yeah, I heard you guys came up with the idea for the ending. It doesn't really work very well. And we were like, what did he do? Okay. So we got the reels, we put it on our moviola in our office, so we watched it, and it was awful. It had nothing to do with what, what the power we thought. And so we sat there, and we just, we had turned on a tape recorder, a little cassette player, and we, we, started, we started talking. We were just talking about, about what this ending could be, and we just, we just talked it through you know, the three of us, and just passionately, and, and just with the power, with, with the kind of filmmaking we wanted to have. And, and I, I remember taking the, the tape player home and just handwriting verbatim of this, mm. this whole story on animation paper and just wrote it out. I think it was, I, I wanna say like six, six or seven pages of just, just picturing. It was not really a script, it was just literally telling visually what, the, what this whole ending would be. And, and I stayed up really late doing this. I was at my parent, living at my parents' house at the time. I drove in really early, and I went up to the head of the studio, his name was Ron Miller, and it was uh, Walt's son-in-law. And, and so I just went in before anybody, and went into his office and set, set you know, this, this on, I made a copy, and then I, I, I um, you know, first thing, and then I set the, this, this thing that I had written on his desk. And I just went back to my office and just working away, working away, and wondering, I don't know, 
And all of a sudden, the director of the film poked his head in to my office and said, hey, do you have a copy of that thing you put on Ron's desk? And I go, yeah, yeah, I have one right here. And he grabbed it to me and walked away. And then, and then by lunchtime, myself and Glenn Keane had been assigned to storyboard the, the, the end of the film. And so we sat there, and, and it, was, it, it worked. I mean, it, it had this, this you know, the, the, he, I wanted, we wanted to have this profound, powerful ending to this film. And if you remember the film, right, it's like, you know, the fox and the hound, and we're like, you know, cute little things and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the ending is like from some other movie. This giant bear and this action, and it's awesome. You know, and it's just like, you know, it's a completely different movie. And it's like, well, that, that Glenn Keen and I did that ending. <laughs> and it's awesome, you know. It's so great, that ending. And, and it was just, but it showed the power of what animation could do, you know. And they weren't happy with us because, you know, I just kept going. And that's about the time I saw... I started seeing the beginnings of computer animation. Yeah, you know, I, I, and, and so um, uh, your time at Disney came to an end. Yeah, well, <laughs> I... <laughs> so that Fox and the Ham story kind of illustrated my relationship with the, <laughs> the, the people who were running animation at the time, where they would typically say, no, go back to your office, and I wouldn't. I would find somebody else to talk to and try to... Because it was just about... I knew we could do, make these films even better. Then, two of my good friends that had worked in Disney Animation and left um, came back working with a guy named Steven Lisberger to do Tron, the very first Tron. And they were storyboarding and choreographing the computer animation. And they invited me up, they had, and I was really curious about this, and they invited me up to, the, um, uh, to their office when they got the very first dailies back for the light cycle sequence from uh, a company in, in New York, a computer animation company in New York called Magi Synthivision. <clears throat> and, and I came up to look at it, and when I saw that, it was like this door in my head opened up, and I walked through, and there was a magnificent new world. It was really like one of those profound moments in my life, and I looked at it, and the first thing I thought to myself, this is what Walt was waiting for. Walt Disney was always striving to, to bring new technology into his, his film, in his films to help give, make the, the animated films more believable. He was always striving for more depth, the multiplying camera, all that stuff. They dabbled in puppet animation and stop motion animation, but it never had the smoothness that hand-drawn animation had. It didn't have, because you could not iterate. There's a notion of, of, of when you're doing art that you, you try something and then you, you, you adjust it, you adjust it, you adjust it, and you keep doing that. And that's one of the beauties of computers. Computers make it, whether it's Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator or paint systems or word processes or anything like that, it's, it makes it so you can iterate and change things and edit and cut and paste and do all this stuff really fast. Where, but hand-drawn animation, you could do that as well, but it was much more labor-intensive because you had to erase a lot, <laughs> you know, and yeah. redraw and, and trace and all that stuff. But, but what Walt was waiting for was three dimensions, was, was making the worlds more believable. And I looked at this and I went, this is it. This is what Walt was waiting for. And it wasn't what I was looking at. It's the potential of what I saw in it. And to me, it was clear as day. It was clear as day. And I turned to everybody else at the studio, and I was like, hey, look! Ah, it's so great! And everybody said, like, eh, it looks kind of cold to me. I go, well, don't look at that! Look at what we're thinking about, what you could do with it. And so... And so I, I got Glenn Keane and I, we kept pushing with, with, you know, within the animation department, and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so, so and it's the same guys that he and I did the, the, 
the, the you know, bear fight sequence of the <laughs> fox and the hound. So I can understand it. So we, but we found a, a young guy who was the head of production of live action at the time, a guy named Tom Wilhite, was developing something with Maurice Sindak. And so he, he said, well, let's do a test. I said, oh, we want to do a test. And he goes, great, let's do it. We could fund it with, with development money from where the wild things are or, you know, for, from a Marie Sindak project. So we took the first two pages of the book, um, children's book, Where the Wild Things Are, where Max is riding on the wall and there's a dog and he, and he chases the dog out the room. So it's two, two pages. And we just took that and we kind of created this, this little test where, where and our idea was that the backgrounds would be done with a computer and we would do hand-drawn animation over it. And so we did the computer animation with Magi Synthivision. And, you know, the guy turned, out, uh, turned into my best friend, Chris Wedge, who did, directed the first Ice Age. Um, and, and he, um, we will always thank him because he introduced my wife, Nancy, to me. So, um, and, and so he, he's, he's, he's really talented. He was working at Magi Synthivision. And so we worked together, you know, on this. And in, in, in I did all the, all the, the backgrounds and the computer work and stuff like that. And then we, we animated like a little geometric shape that represented Max and represented the dog through the scene and did all the camera work. And then we took it and, and gave it to Glenn and Glenn did the animation over, over you know, over the, ba the background stuff. We, we printed out on um, Photostats that were the size of animation paper, and he did this this drawing, and we did it, and then we colorized it with um, a computer paint system that we kind of invented for the project with tone mats and everything, and we we did this test, and then we showed it to everybody, and the whole time we were doing the test, I said, I want to have a feature film that we can say, look at this amazing test. Here's a film we could um, we could do with it, and. A good friend of mine had given me a, um, uh, a collection of uh, sort of fantasy and science fiction short stories, and in it was a little novella, a 40-page story by a guy named Thomas Deesh. It was called The Brave Little Toaster. And we, I got um, Tom Wilhite, the live action, had to license, to, to get an option on The Brave Little Toaster. We did, and we started developing it as a feature film. And Joe Ramft and I did this at the Disney studio while we were doing the Wild Things test at Magi, and Glenn was working on it. So I had these things going, and it was so exciting, you know. And, and we, we finished the, the Wild Things test. We, we you know, presented it and then pre and, and pitched um, the, the, you know, um, the Brave Little Toaster as this, we can use this for it. And... I didn't know this thing called politics, but, <laughs> but I was just so excited and eager and all like that. And, and the, it, the whole project had been undermined by, by the manager of the animation department, the guy who told me to just do what I was told. And so we pitched the whole project to, to the head of the studio and <clears throat> he asked, well, how much is this going to cost? And, and we did a rough budget that was going to be the same as a regular animated feature film, and he said the only reason to, the manager said the only reason to do computer animation if it, if it makes it cheaper or makes it, you know, quicker to do. And he, he, they, and he got up and walked out and said, you know, we're not going to do this. And then the manager of the animation department, after, you know, within, by the time he got down to his office, he picked up the phone, called me, went down, and he fired me. He said, your, your, your project is complete, your, 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 your employment with the Walt Disney Studios is now terminated. Boom. And I was like, I can't tell you how devastating that was. To have a dream from a young, you know, young boy, like a 13, 14 year old, and a and, and singular focus, they want to work for the Disney Studios, to go through college, be trained by these great Disney artists, to get there and just keep pushing to make it better, to be fired from the place of your dreams. And I'll be honest with you, I never told anybody I was fired. I, 
by the time that, that, that this happened, I had met Ed Catmull, who was doing the, the um, Lucasfilm Computer Div Division and doing computer animation research at Lucasfilm. And they loved the stuff I was doing, but they were not in any market. For, I was looking for someone to do the computer animation backgrounds for a toaster. And, and they, were not, they were just a research facility. And I, you know, I, Tom Wilhite kept me on to, to and there was the last few things I needed to do on the, on the wow things test. So he, he kept me on in his division, you know, but I was not part of animation anymore and my days were numbered and I finished the project. And during that time, I went to a, um, a computer graphics conference at the Queen Mary and Ed was there and gave a talk, and then he saw me, he said, how's Toaster going? I said, it's, it's been shelved, and um, you know, it's been shelved. It says it, they didn't want to do anything with it. And he, and, he, and he was so sad, and he came back, and then in the middle of a, 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 a talk, I'll never forget it, you know, from behind a column in the grand ballroom, it's like, chut, chut, chut. <laughs> and I, I, I snuck there, and, and, and he said, do you want to come work with us? And I was like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> you know? And um, so it was just a freelance job he had that would last about a month. And I said, I, you know, I'll go. And, and so I, I basically had got, I didn't get fired from Disney once. I got actually fired twice. Um, and then, then I got let go a second time, but, but I was, I, I had gone up to, you know, by this time I, I was on my way up to Lucasfilm. But it was, uh, it had a profound effect, you know, of, of just this, um, but, but it was the best thing that ever happened Yeah, because to it me. made, that became, that was the start of Pixar, basically, yeah, right? Yeah, it was the start of Pixar, start of, you know, and, and I just never let go of that dream. And Ed Catmull had always had a dream to do a computer animated feature film one day. And he, but the no, the tools didn't exist and all like that, and he was just working. And so, when I first went up to Lucasfilm, I was so worried that I was going to need to learn how to program because, you know, that's really what all the computer and Magi was. Everything was all programmed based animation. Nothing was interactive back then. And um, oh man, I, I hate math, and I'm going to have to like. <laughs> I went to art school to not do math. Sure. I have to do math, and so, so we went to, um, so I went up there, and I found that I was sitting around, and it was like, I had, I had, I was so into computer animation at that point. I was getting every tape I could get. We I was looking at all this stuff, and when I got up there, and I looked at, and there was a tiny, tiny group of people at doing the computer animation research at Lucasfilm, computer graphics research, and I realized, oh my goodness. Ed had gotten every top, all the stuff I loved that I'd seen, he had gotten those people there. And I said, Ed, how did you get all these amazing people? And he just goes, oh, it's easy. I, I just try to hire people that are smarter than myself. <laughs> and I laughed. And I, but I walked away and I thought, just from my experience at Disney, of these people being so threatened by, by young people and, and people who are smarter than them, to have a, a leader that says, oh, I try to hire people that are smarter than myself. And then he lets them be, be amazing and lets them do, be stars, lets them shine. And I was like, that's the guy I want to work for. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with him and I realized these guys all have PhDs. I'm never going to know what they know about computers. But then I thought, you know what? They don't know how to bring a, a character to life and give it personality and emotion through pure movement. That's what I was taught by the great Disney animators. They don't know that. So I said, I'm just gonna sit right next to them and I'm gonna work in collaboration with them. I don't need to know what they know. And because, guess what, and they, they don't need know to know. You, yeah, and they don't need to know what I know. And it found, and, I, and, and what, what happened in my working relationship with Bill Rees and Eben Osby and Ed Catmull and Tom Porter, the, 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 those original guys, who, by the way, are all still at Pixar and we're all making movies together. Um, the way I worked with them, I coined this phrase, that the art challenges technology and technology inspires the art. 
it's this incredible kind of yin-yang, this circle that happens. And what it is is that I would, I would say, I would get so excited and I would draw something. Like, Can we do this? And they go, no, we can't. Not yet. Wait. And they would disappear and they'd come back. <laughs> and I go, how's that? And I go, that's even better. Oh, my goodness. And they were like, well, if you can do that, can you do that? And I would get an idea I would have never thought of in a million years if I hadn't seen the R&D that they were mm. doing. And I loved the mistakes when things didn't work out because then I was like, oh, my goodness, can, we, can you do that again? Oh, then we could do this. And it became this, this thrilling, thrilling, like it was so exciting that we were inventing this stuff and it was so fun to keep like developing new stuff in this incredible circle that kept happening. And I just, and, and, and our whole philosophy was that the, that the technology is never gonna entertain an audience by itself. Mm. It's what you do with a technology. 